Okay, we're in. Stand and do the pledge. Please to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Um, Nancy, if you could read the book input. Okay. The first public input session is a 15 minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement. But a second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. The speaker will give his or her name, address, and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non residents the opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning the subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sessions, for example, matters involving personnel, cannot be made during public input. You may type in your comments and click on the live stream link on the top of the agenda and send them to us, and we will read them. And we actually have some human <laughs> public input tonight. So, why don't you go ahead and get started? Sure. And kick it off. Uh, my name is Matthew Leggett. Uh, I live in Lebanon. Uh, my son Kyle Leggett currently goes to the middle school in eighth grade and is looking forward to going to high school. So um, I wanted to come and speak for a few minutes and just talk about a subject matter that had come up recently. It has to do with the Department of Education's newsletter that was released in December. Uh, it's uh, the title of it is Joint Statement of Commitment and Support for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Maine Schools. Um, recently, we ran into a situation where a teacher had interpreted this on her own and made some changes that I didn't agree with. Um, I think it's something that the board needs to review and maybe give instruction to um, the principal. I'm, I'm not quite sure how the hierarchy works, um, but I think some instruction and something needs to be looked into it so that way uh, clear direction can be given in the classroom. I mentioned this when I was talking to the principals today, and uh, super, what was your name again? Audra. Bo Audra. <laughs> yeah, um, we talked earlier today, and uh, this article talks about how uh, the school system has been systemically racist in their teachings, and I brought out that I didn't think that there was any racist teachings in school currently in Noble. Um, I asked if there were any examples to bring it forward, and they said there hadn't been any. Um, the, again, the teacher in Kyle, or a teacher um, had an interpretation of this that I didn't agree with. Also, I learned today there's a coalition of teachers that are getting together and fighting discrimination. I'm all for fighting discrimination. I don't think anyone should be discriminated against, no matter what their gender, color, uh, religion, any of that. There should be zero discrimination. From what I heard today, there is zero discrimination, yet there is a lot of media attention around um, the subject matter. And it's, a, and it's having people are making decisions based up, off of that. And that's what I saw in my son's class. And I, I just think this needs to be looked at because those types of decisions are being made, even though, like I, we talked about today, there is no, at least in our school system, there isn't a blatant uh, racism that's happening or being taught in the classroom. So if changes are coming down and we're changing curriculum or, or changing how we're teaching the students in class, um, I would like there to be more guidance maybe and more open discussion before those changes take place. So that's, again, if you have some time to look at this article, um, when I spoke with the teacher about the matter, she referenced this article specifically and said that's why she made the changes in her classroom, uh, which I felt were inappropriate at the time. And I just want to avoid that going to, in the future. I don't know if this is the correct spot for that, but hopefully <laughs> this is the right place to talk about it. Thank you. Yep. And we all do have that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this, okay. Um, the, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we have a bunch of other public input. You, you do. So I'm yeah. going to. No. Or... Okay. Should I, is it appropriate? Like, you can, can I go or? Do... Absolutely. I don't want to be disrespectful. No, you certainly can. Okay. Uh, Mr. Leggett, don't you want to listen to all of it? Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Then I'll take off. Have a good day. You too. 
So um, I'm going to do all of the public input. I'm going to turn my camera off and um, just so that I can see everything that I'm doing. And I, as I told the board earlier, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, I do have a bit of a cold. So if I start to cough, I will survive, I promise. And I apologize in advance. So here we go. Uh, let's see. All righty. Our first piece of public input tonight is from Santa Alaire of North Berwick. Hello, I am not sure if this has already been decided. However, it is crucial that the school district goes back to full-time in-school learning next year due to many reasons. Children's mental health, opportunity to socialize, as well as financial impact that families have around reduced schedules. A lot of parents are not fortunate enough to be able to work from home and have to spend additional resources for daycare before and after care. Thank you. That is number one. Two, Elizabeth Key of Berwick. Please do not change the start time. My kids do not want to be in the mass in mass more than they have to, and will like uh, and will unlikely benefit from one more hour of school per day this close to the end of the year. Uh, Reagan Poria from Lebanon. A sudden change in schedule with one month left of school will not do anyone any favors, especially for my kiddos who for who is on the spectrum and relies heavily on consistency. I urge you to please keep the schedule as is and wait for next school year for any change in school hours. Christina Brown of North Berwick. The news of a schedule change to the elementary school day coming in with five weeks left of school, 18 in-person days for the students at NBES with minimum notice to parents and staff is absolutely absurd. The disruption is not going to be made just to the students' mornings. Their entire days are going, going to be shifted. The amount of time that is going to be needed to adjust the um, adjust to new schedules on top of the standardized testing is going to be they have coming <laughs> up is a concern of mine. It is going to mean that special specials times change, literacy times change. The kids and parents, along with their leaders, have been making well, along with their teachers, have been making things work since September. The short notice of such a big change is a slap in the face for all of us. What are the reasons of this change? Why does it need to be done now? Instead of wrapping up the year and focusing on their work, they will be learning new schedules and figuring things out like they had to do in the beginning of the year. I just do not see how this is beneficial to the students, the parents and their teachers. Is there anyone who's actually looking at research that shows that this will somehow support them? Or does it just support the numbers that the district is only, that the district is searching out? When did we move away from supporting our students as people and only care about what our numbers show? Are we a school district that wants to be known for their lack of communication, constantly blindsiding the teachers and families that invest so much into it? What do we want to be known as? The fact that as of this moment right now, parents still have not been officially told of this change is absolutely mind boggling. Drastic changes to the lives of our families deserve more respect than that, than what is being given. Not to mention that the fact that the changes without even being told the actual reason adds in to the level of disrespect that is being shown. We want our students to show respect but we need to be, to as a collective district, also need to show some respect. Uh, Kathleen Besk from Berwick. There are five weeks left of school. These children have gone through as much change in the last 14 months. Why can't we just let them have stability for five weeks? Change the times back next year. Alicia Abbott of North Berwick. Thank you for making the tough decision at the end of the year for the better of our students. I am thankful that you have decided to pull our children in for additional educational time by starting school at the regular expected start time. If COVID has taught us anything, we will adjust to meet the needs of our kids. Blaze Massey of Lebanon. I'm following up on my previous inquiry to the board regarding implementing assigned seating within Noble High School to, follow, to allow the six foot for 15 minute close contact rule. For the second time this season, a baseball player has been removed from competition for being deemed a close contact. He will miss four games in a very short season. The current policy where everyone in a classroom is considered a close contact is asking students to risk their participation in sports, not for contracting COVID, but for just attending school. Several students have already chosen to study remotely full-time, missing out on valuable in-person class time. The solution is simple, use assigned seating. That would greatly reduce the number of students deemed close contact, allowing many students to return to normal classes and athletes to the field. References the main DOE guidelines for opening schools, investigating outbreaks in K-12 schools. Uh, thank you for your action in this matter. Caden Chandler of Berwick. 
We have one month of school left and you all keep changing the schedule. It's crazy and hard to keep up with. The younger kids are already having a tough time as it is. And now you want to go changing things again. All right. Pamela Parks of North Berwick. They never give parents enough notice to plan when they make major changes. They should stop changing their schedules though, especially the special needs children. When the schedules change again, it affects the extra help they receive. Sometimes after a schedule change, my son will either receive more or less of those extra help meetings. It was a challenging, it was challenging enough <clears throat> trying to work the way, work the help into the already crazy schedule this year. Just when the kids get into a groove with school, they change the schedule all around and the kids get stressed out and confused. The students and parents, mental health should also be extremely important to you all. Another change will not be wise right now. Honestly, a lot of parents, kids, and definitely teachers do not agree with another ch change of any sort. I implore you to actually listen to your teachers and your students and just leave things the way they are. There's only six weeks to go. Please, my son has struggled enough this year. I don't think he can handle any more changes at school. To be honest, I can't keep changing my schedule around to accommodate all the changes, especially now that my son has finally figured out how to manage it all and is getting really great grades. Mentally, he can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. Leave the school schedule the way it is and let these kids finish out the school year happy on a super positive note that they get through this year from hell in one piece. Kaylin Bell, North Berwick. It's absolutely insane to change up the scheduled start times for elementary level with a few weeks left to school. Not only for parents who have made sacrifices and changes in their schedule to figure this out because the school decided to go an hour or, hour or later, but for kids who've developed a routine up until this point in the year. It's not helpful for anyone to make changes to such a significant or such a significant change for morning times, but for short time. Shana Dumont of North Berwick. Hearing from my daughter that the school start times will change on Monday have me very upset. I've worked to get schedules worked out, now to possibly have them change. This is also hard because my daughter in high school has a study hall first block and can't get to school till 9 a.m. This was not a problem till now. I'm a substitute in the schools and can't get to work until my kids are dropped off at school. Please do not make this change. Not now. Not with only a few weeks left. Now is not the time to change schedules for families like me. Jen Baldwin of North Berwick. I am just curious about why the elementary age children going back on Wednesdays wasn't an option before changing start times. Thank you. Shannon Ferguson of Lebanon. As much as I feel like the district has done a wonderful job overall handling COVID situations and having the children in a school as much as possible, I feel compelled to say that the last minute changes to schedules not related to close contact situations feel extremely frustrating and can be a bit blindsiding. Alicia Dion of Berwick. There are not enough school days left in the year to change the kids' routine again. Let them finish out the year with the routine they are used to. Changes now will not prove helpful for the kids, nor will it improve le time learning. I am disappointed that our district is trying to implement an earlier start in May. Bo Lambert of North Berwick. Based upon some of the recent scheduling decisions, I would like to know when the last time a school board member visited a school and had a conversation with teachers. Jessica Key, oh, Jessica Kelly of North Berwick. While I haven't received formal notification of the schedule change and have only seen the post on Facebook, I'm very happy about it. Going back to the normal schedule is very much appreciated. I felt that the later start never benefited the kids and caused more stress in the morning as I'd need to step away from work for the later drop off. I hope that we have moved forward with getting back to normal schedules for our children as we finish up the year. Thank you very much for everything you've done. I, for one, think that we have a great district and the communication under the circumstances has been great. Erica Johnson, Lebanon. Changes in school day hours with less than two months left in the school year when it is not an emergency such as COVID related is just not fair to parents who have been rearranging their schedule for the past year in order to accommodate the necessary changes in the school schedule. And let's see, Jeff, Jennifer Gamlin of Berwick. I'm frustrated with the lack of communication around the change in start time. We had to learn this of this change from information piece together from other parents, transportation staff, and our Ride 360 app, rather than a notice or phone call with a detailed explanation from our school. If we did not have these other resources, we would be blindsided by a change supposedly happening in four days. We understand flexibility is needed under the current health climate, but we need clear information with adequate notice to incorporate these changes into our family schedule and prepare our daughter for her new morning routine. When there is not clear communication, I feel like families are not being considered in these decisions or our schedules are not being respected, which is hard feeling to stomach. While I appreciate COVID notices, I would prefer them to be spaced out if it meant that I could re 
receive timely notifications about such significant school changes. Thank you for taking time to read my statement. And this is our last piece, and this is uh, from Kelly Gray in Berwick. Hold on, I gotta see it better. Oh. <laughs> I am ready to ask you to please consider what has been asked of our district families before making the decision to extend the school day simply so that our young students can take more standardized testing. We have endured remote days, class quarantines, driving our students to school to take pressure off the transportation system, and have made countless other adapt adaptations. Most have done this happily, so our students can enjoy a semi-normal school day experience. Working from home, I have it easier than most. But even still, I've arranged my workday and available meeting times to accommodate drop-offs and pickups and whatever else gets thrown our way. Changing the start of school means parents adjusting workdays when we already have the challenge of summer ahead of us in five short weeks. This all goes without saying that a schedule change of this magnitude for elementary school students and their teachers would be hugely and incredibly disruptive. Finally, I must say this year has been fuller and more enriching than I ever imagined it could be. Much credit <coughs> to the truly, truly outstanding Mrs. Pennell in fifth grade. Please do not disrupt what is left of the school year by extending the elementary school day with so little left of the year. It can't possibly be worth it. So that is your public info for this evening. Thank you. And we will address both of those topics. We had the seating chart topic and then the elementary start time topic that will go under the superintendent's um, report when we get down there. I'll talk through some Thank of that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's me. Um, do we have a student report today? We don't. Okay. Do, don't we have to do this in minutes? Oh, the minutes, all the minutes. Um, okay, so I, for some, I mean, let's go through and do them anyway. I had thought we had already done the 25th, but um, if we don't have a record of that, then. We think that the record's on the 8th, and we don't have the minutes for the 8th. Yeah, I just remember looking at it saying it was mostly the, it basically the minutes were the same as, okay. Do we, do you want us to do it again? I don't think we need to do it again. Okay. Well, I see, I was, I ended up not being there for the March 25th one. It was a short meeting by the time I got there and you guys were done. So I don't know if you need to add me to being absent on the 25th or? Well, it says you seconded, uh, I think you joined at some point. Because this, at the very end, it says you second you, the motion to adjourn was seconded by you. Okay, then I think this must have been the eighth. Was when was small day the expression? You the yeah, the 25th. The 25th, I think you were here because that's when we were talking about the high school plans. It was the second time we talked about it. I think just to be safe, we should call the other meeting. April 1st was Monday, Thursday. I think we should have approval. Right, I mean, we yeah. just, yeah. just yeah. And, and you did make a motion, so I, I think okay. you were here. All right. There is the next to last paragraph. Um, there's no person's name by who seconded Mr. Dwyer's um, going into the second session. We have to have a person saying they don't like. Yep. So I think it probably was me. I would, I'm going to bet that you're correct. I think that was made. Yeah. So why don't you put this part of there in there? And then I, I'll vote to uh, the minutes as amended. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Then? I'm abstaining because I was absent. Okay. Great. Um, I'm okay. just I'm double checking. That was the March 25th one, right? Yeah, and actually, Estrita, okay. it says Estrita and Rebecca were also absent. Okay. So then, the April 1st. First. That's right. So she That's the one I was not at. Yes, and I've noted that you were not there. I'll make a motion to accept this written one. I will second. Oh, Travis again. 
I'll second that. Well, if it, she second. wants to know, yeah. So no, she, she was going to second it. Oh, okay. Um, all in favor? I can't remember if I was at that one or not. It, uh, it says you were not. Okay. I know I had to miss a few. So it says Nancy, right. Linda, uh, yeah, so do we have enough to. Yeah, okay. no. is, there, is somebody not? Is anybody not? Yes. Uh, Rebecca's Rebecca. not here tonight. Okay. Um, she let us know that she was not feeling well. Okay, and then April 15th, and that was the virtual one. That was the very brief virtual one, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll make a motion to accept the list of the 15th. I'll second the motion. Uh, all in favor? Okay. So now on to agenda item number five, Title 28, Section 1485, Authorization to Transfer Funds. Sure. So this is a routine yearly request that comes out right about this time of year. And it's basically stating that um, you're authorizing the superintendent of schools to be able to shift up to 5% from line items during the next couple of months. So um, I think Denise, you can read this statement and then we do need to make a motion. Okay. okay. Make a motion to read that. What's the statement? Oh, okay. So that is the motion. Yeah. So, um, do you want to read it? Sure. Okay. So I'll make a motion that pursuant to section uh, 1485-4 of Title 20-A, the superintendent of schools be authorized to transfer not more than of the total, the total appropriation of, for any cost center in the current fiscal year operating budget to another cost center or among other cost centers, provided that the total current fiscal year operating budget shall not be increased by such transfers. A second, I'm going to use a second. I'm sorry, who seconded? Linda. Linda. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All in favor? Thank you. Um... Okay, so updates. Yep, just a few updates. Our student attendance for the week after vacation was um, a low of 89% in present and a high of 94. Uh, most of it hovered in the 92-94%. Um, and then the week of 5-3, which is right now, um, 89 again, and that was on a Monday. So both Mondays were a little lower. Um, and then the high this week was 97 so that's that. And then for our staff for the last two weeks, our average is ranging 95% present. Um, and that range goes from 93 to 97%. So that's that. I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so you've been reading these attendances. Do we ever look back at pre-COVID to see this? Yes, we do. Harrison? We do. Um, we actually are some of our hardest times of year, February, March, and April, right? Leading right up to April break. Okay. And we've done better. Um, we have done better, um, especially with with staff. Um, yep. I have a question in regards to the what, what changes that we made to the high school schedule with the Thursday uh, attendance. Is have we seen any changes with the participation in the thirty minute walk classes they have? There was an increase when I spoke with Ali. They they were getting good um, attendance for that, but okay. we can give you another update on that next next time as well because it'll be a couple weeks out and then what about the ninth grade here coming in i would assume that'd be yes fine, yeah that's that's wednesdays <coughs> Wednesday. okay. well unfortunately one of the first in-person days for our ninth grade we had <clears throat> uh, a team that had to i think we had a COVID issue so but yeah still accounted for but they're in person time they are getting here they're they're having good attendance that way. But we can extrapolate those two pieces for you in more detail. And then we just wanted to provide a quick update on athletics, just to give you some records. Today was a busy day. We had a track meet 
that was moved from Wednesday, yesterday to today. So that um, finished, we did well with that. The individual scores went well. We have softball today, we had lacrosse, and then um, girls lacrosse started at six o'clock in Kittery. So I'll give you our records because they're not typically posted. Our baseball is three and one, our softball is two and two, our girls lacrosse is zero and four, our boys lacrosse is one and two, and our track numbers um, are strong. That's that's what we have for, for record for that. Um, our some of our teams have had some issues with attendance and, and the quarantining and different things like that. So that's why we're a little bit all over the place on that. So those are those updates. And I have a question. The sure. kids um, in sports, as of what, last week or two weeks ago, they're allowed to not wear masks during a sure. competition and that's all going okay? Right. We are following the main principles association guidelines that came out. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. yeah. All right. And those were our quick updates. I have a couple of questions, but I'm not sure where they should fall. Okay. If it could be sort of, it, I think this is, that was a good section, but like, do we have, um, like now that we have a good number of teachers vaccinated and even some of the older students, um, what are the guidelines around, like, I guess teachers or anybody who's vaccinated, what are the guidelines around them having to, be out of school if they were in contact. We've had teachers that have been vaccinated and um, when the cohort has needed to quarantine, they have not needed to quarantine. So they are able to come into school. Okay, and is the same true for students that have been vaccinated? We have not run into that at that level of students at this point in time. I mean, the kids yeah. that are old enough to get vaccinated right. are barely in school. Right, so. yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Tuesday, Next Monday week. or Tuesday, right? Pfizer will well, be approved. Uh, I know, but by the time, yeah, right. well, the, actually get the the time they get their final their one. second one, it's still going to, yeah. School's going to be out. We are, I, I guess I can, I'm giving a little update on that right now. That, um, Wait, so is that a from York County, uh, from York County, it's, I haven't seen the official word yet. I heard it's coming very shortly. But the York County group, who, you know, with all the vaccine clinics, it is, I just got word today that we're looking at uh, starting, and I assume you'll hear here shortly, um, that we're going to start going to schools. Yes. That evening, that are afternoons, mm -hmm. and doing vaccines to Thank students and staff right. as much as you can with the focus on the students from the approved age. Right. Yes. Right. We'll start coming down the pipeline within the next couple of weeks. Right. You'll start seeing us show up at schools to get vaccinations. And do we know, I know you gave us official numbers, but do we know sort of, that necessarily should improve, what percentage of the teachers are vaccinated? What we got were just the total by, by the school. So that included everybody in the school, not just teachers, but educational and techs. Yeah, staff. Yes, adult staff. Yeah. And that was only those that reported. Right. But no, you gave us two numbers. You gave us, I thought you gave us the, well, do, I'm wondering what, what do we know? Like some people actually showed you documentation, but that's what we asked before for. that. Yep. Yeah, that's what we asked for is the documentation to see that they So that was a very low number. That yes. was like 20%. Right. Right. Do we think that only 20% of our teachers have chosen to get vaccinated? No, we think it could be higher or that they've only had one and they're not sent, submitting until they have two. But we're not demanding that, that we get proof of that. What it helps us do, though, and what has happened is that when we've had to look at a cohort, we that's how we're getting a lot of these, because we're saying, if you have been vaccinated, let's see the proof of that so that we can, um, you know, for that. So if we have to quarantine, we don't need to quarantine. So... A tremendous amount of feedback to the board to allow teachers a little bit of leeway to get vaccinated. So I do think it would be very before we made any schedule changes. So I don't know if we're not allowed to ask for that information. If we're not allowed to, then we're not allowed to. But 
I, I, I mean, it, it just, it's, it's very muddy waters when yes. we're making an entire district plan right. around this and then can't actually have the information mm -hmm. to support that plan. Most, most staff have been very forthcoming with that information, but I would be naive to think that we have staff and that everybody has provided it, I think. Mm -hmm. There's privacy. So we can assume that 20% of the staff has been vaccinated. I think that's the hard fact. And we can now. also assume that everybody who wants to get vaccinated has can them. get vaccinated. Yeah. yeah. And our, our nurses in the buildings are continuing to request the information from staff, go to staff and ask them. Get but that's a tremendous percentage not getting vaccinated. But, but I don't know if it's I, not I don't that, think it's yeah. that big of a percentage of not getting vaccinated. I can tell you, and I don't know, you know, I work at the clinic in Sanford twice a week at home, and I've seen our staff come through regularly. Mm -hmm. And that's just two days that I'm there. So they're there, they're coming, they're getting vaccinated. They just don't have to tell us. Right, it's a privacy. Yeah. 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 It's, it's it's a term, I understand yeah. private medical information. But so I, I completely understand that. But as a board, we have, We've been asked to consider vaccinations as a really significant part of whether or not we move forward with plans for in-person learnings, and which I feel like we've done that. But right. so we're we're just going to have to, I think, going forward when it comes to next year, we're going to have to maybe make plans without that information. Because they have the opportunity to do it if they want. I mean, everybody, right. everybody who could do it has the opportunity at this point. Mm -hmm. So I think that if people haven't had it done yet are doing so purposely for whatever reason. Fine. And I, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah, I don't actually really, personally, it doesn't matter to me one way or the other. I just, I just feel like we have been asked repeatedly mm -hmm. to make our decisions using that information and, um, I, I, what I can also add to that, similar to what Travis said, is that when that first um, age group came up, that first age group for um, vaccinations, there was a great deal of interest from our staff in that. And I know many of them followed up with that. Um, so I believe that that 20% is, is higher. Much higher. I mean, like, much higher yes. as well. Yes. Uh, it, I, I, I'm, I'm shocked, shocked at that number. Really. Yeah. I think it's way higher than that, and it's because um, you know they don't technically have to tell us, and then that's their right. But there's also probably a good portion that are still struggling to get their not struggling, but still in the process to get their second shot. Yes, right. Because we have just recently, within the last two weeks, uh, really opened up the vaccine clinics yeah. to be able to get freely go in and get a shot. And so we're, you know, everybody, everybody has the access now very easily yeah. to go get a shot. Not like it was a couple of weeks ago where it was yeah. easy to get a shot. So you, know, you can walk into Sanford no, when there's open. Have to send there's there's no appointments now. You can just walk in there. But if somebody asks you if you've been vaccinated and you only had one shot, you may say no. Correct. And it was probably, it was probably mid to three quarters in April when they were getting their first shot. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a high percentage. It probably is not going to second shot. Yet. Correct. I think I think in the next two weeks, I would assume you, if, if you read question mm -hmm. or read um, okay. ask that question, yes. you might right. see a, ma a massive increase. Right. Right. What was the chat that just popped up? Um, it was from Jamie, and she bas she just said we ha we do also have quite a few younger staff members. Like so, we weren't in those first and second tiers of of. Um, folks getting their shots early on. And just like you said, Travis, now's the time where they're actually freely able to go in and get their shots, so. So some of the younger folks didn't get their shots right. until probably right. this middle of April, mm -hmm. and they got a second shot. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, uh, over in New Hampshire, people can just walk into Walgreens. I know there's other places doing it. But having to go into the uh, drive through line, I'm like, wow, why is it bombed here? And that's what I heard, is that they're giving out the shots to just walk in. So for other people listening that still need them. Yeah, pretty much everybody now is a walk-in walk aspect. I mean, I worked in Sanford yesterday, and we had 
probably 20 walk-ins when we only did 120 people for the whole the whole morning section that we're there, which we can do 500 usually. Yeah. Um, so it's everybody can come in now if they want for the most part very easily get a shot. But we will get updated numbers on that as well. Travis, since you're in Sanford, um, can you let us know, is it still just Moderna and the Pfizer there, um, or is Johnson & Johnson back in? Because I think there also might be some issues with people going because of the whole Johnson & Johnson thing. I have not seen the Johnson & Johnson one at Sanford yet. Um, it's been Moderna and Pfizer. It's been Moderna focused lately. Um, but I believe with the changes for the 12 to 18 year olds coming up, you're going to see some more of the Pfizer availability in Sanford. And I do know that on Tuesday, to my knowledge on Tuesday, we still have our Johnson and Johnson clinic that's happening here at the high school on Tuesday night. Also, anybody can go to New Hampshire. All the, the yep. kids under uh, 18 can go to New Hampshire very mm -hmm. easily mm -hmm. to get Pfizer. Mm -hmm. Right now, right now, the Sanford one's not going under 18. Uh, but I think within the next week or two, they will be doing under 18. But as of today, they were not doing under 18. All right. Um, Limit updates? Sure. You, in your packet, received the probationary status one teachers, two, and three teachers. Um, I can read them off, but I we typically don't, I believe. I think you just typically all at once just accept the whole group of probationary one staff, probationary two, and probationary three. Does this document that just oh, get included in that? Uh, yes. I didn't realize it was tabs at the bottom. I'm like, that's the probationary one staff oh. teachers. No, 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 they're not just tabs at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the list was really small. Right? No, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> so we would just need, um, unless there are questions, a, a nominate. I'm going to get there. Okay. So, <laughs> it's a tab at the bottom, right, Travis? You said? Yeah, it's on yeah. the bottom. Yeah. Like page three. We got it. Of the agenda. Andre, would you mind just for those of us who are not educators, sure. just reminding us? Uh, sort of how this process works from year to year. Sure. Great. So up until this fall, when you hire a teacher, they are considered on probationary status for three years. Um, and that means during that three-year probationary period, they go through um, a pretty extensive evaluation process. And during that time, you are able to um, you know, you nominate them every year, or if it's not working out during that time, you don't have to go through a longer process of just cause. That means that if it's just not working out, um, you can part your ways. And um, from this hire, this fall onward, it's only two years. So um, they've shortened it by a year, which it was about 20 years ago, it was two years. The three years is really nice because there's so much coming at you your first year, and there's such a huge learning curve coming into to the job. And then to have those two other years for all that support and assistance really makes sense. Two years is short. And if you think about some of our teachers like that came in new last year and then went out in March, and you know, are still remote, that's that's a really hard go of, of that. So um, so that's what so our So we got the three sets. years, but then next year we're only going to see two tabs in this. Yeah, we'll see three because we'll have new hires next year. We'll have new hires for the fall. Okay. So you're still going to have three tabs for a couple of years. Right. Okay. Right. But you won't have these. Right. Right. So once they, so this list of probationary three, this is their final one. This they go to continue in contract. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the probationary one were hired this year. Probationary two were last year. Well, do we know? Uh, uh, okay. I'll make a motion. Uh, 
motion to accept the, the we need to each individual one? I think you can do all of them at the same time. Uh, probation, the supplied list of probationary one, two, and three teachers can move on to their next step in their process. And congratulations to the probationary three for moving forward. I'll second it. All in favor? Okay, so I'll move on to, we have a leave of absence request from Shauna Street, who is the counselor in North Berwick. And the leave of absences are really supposed to be in, in March, by March 1st. And um, this came to us late. Shauna is um, expecting um, a child in September, a baby in September. And um, at the, came to the decision that she really wanted to ask for a request for a leave of absence. This is supported by um, Mike, um, because um, if you think about a year's leave of absence uh, for a counseling position, it's gonna be harder to fill than if it's just a six or a 12 week position. So this is definitely supported for that consistency of having a counselor in the building from September on. Um, so that's that request. And we do need a motion for that. You want to be I'll make a motion to accept the leave of absence from Shaw Street. Mr. DeWine was on a roll tonight. Mm -hmm. I seconded it. Nancy seconded. Get it. She's on a roll too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All in favor for those of you online? Okay, and then we have a retirement, which is also an extremely impressive amount of time. Sharon Thompson, Hussey School Physical Education. That's 39 years. Mm -hmm. Um, she taught when she was at Hussey, she taught first grade. Uh, yes, she, so she taught primary age and then went in and got her um, PE degree. So she's currently the, the PE teacher at Hussey. So 39 years. Well, I'd like to make a motion to accept uh, Sharon Thompson's retirement with the breath. I know the kids loved her. They yes. Do. And, uh, yes. She's a great teacher. Mm -hmm. I'll second that one too. This is Nancy. Thank you. All in favor? Lynn? Lynn? Are you in favor, Lynn? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. With your hands. <laughs> okay, and then we do have some resignations. And this time of year, we typically, this is where we see the movement. You know, this is where we see people relocating or, um, you know, changing jobs or positions. So I will um, just share with you the resignations and um, you, we do need a motion on these as well. So I'll go through and just read the names. So Brooke Valencia, who's in North Berwick as the behavior interventionist. Donna Tem, who is Excel in Lebanon. Elizabeth Caverly, who is at Knowlton grade five. Rebecca Bolstridge, who is at Knowlton special education. Heidi Schul, who is Noble Middle School Science. Sloan Sorrell, who was at MHA for special education. Helen Stamus, who is um, right now at Noble High School. <coughs> and James Sutter, who is science at the high school. Um, so those are those positions. Do we have even like what we see in a pattern, like what kind of that's a lot of teachers that have just resigned. Right. And and like I said, some of them are relocating to different parts of the state, some of them have other positions, um, some of them are changing careers. Um, so it's it's a mix of, of different things. There's no real pattern yet. In the past, how many usually resign at the end of the school year? We saw like this seems about normal. That's about right. Yep. Yeah. About that amount. And if you look at our P1 list, this is how many staff we hired last year. Mm -hmm. right. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, we do get, we Are do we lose them out to other districts. I'm just looking through the list. No, not other districts. I, I want to say there's a few here that. There's a couple, there's at least three here that are, are relocating. Then there are some here that are changing careers, that are, are going into other other jobs other than education. And there are some that 
don't have other positions but aren't here. Well, I'll make a motion to accept the resignations just with Swift. Mr. Joanne. Thank you. I'll second it. This is <laughs> Thank you. All in favor? All in favor? Lynn, we need your hand for all in favor. No. Raise your hand, Lynn. They can't see you. We need to see you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the first thing is that our food, uh, school nutrition department received a $5,000 grant for summer feeding from full plates, full potential, and we heard that information today. Um, so that's a nonprofit 501c3 um, out of Portland. So um, that will help us this summer for $5,000. That's great. Um, and then a little bit more about vaccinations. We, um, as your county superintendent group, has been meeting um, and talking with members of the CDC and a couple different um, York Hospital and a couple different organizations um, about um, offering vaccinations for our students. Um, the expectation right now is that Pfizer is going to be adopted for or approved for 12 and up Monday or Tuesday. So there has been a discussion um, about di districts, what the interest is in having um, a clinic at the school for students, that, for parents that are interested in that. So um, there's continuing discussions around that. As Travis said, there was a meeting this afternoon. I should probably get some more information tomorrow morning during the superintendent's meeting on the status of that. Most of the districts in this area agreed that it would be better to have it here than to have our students have to travel to Sanford, um, that it just makes sense to, to have it in their buildings. So um, they're talking about that. Um, the logistics of that. They know when our everybody's last day of school is. They're trying to back it up and look through that. Um, so I think one of the things that they're going to be requesting of us is to just get out a general survey to families, a brief general survey for students at that age to take just to see what the interest is because what's going to have to happen is they, with the Pfizer, um, they have to have the exact amount and know what to send and know how to store it. Uh, so there may be a pre-survey just to, to see what numbers we may need and then a formal registration. Um, so you, we may likely get that out tomorrow if they say, yep, yeah, go ahead and, and get, that, get a survey out. So that may be coming. Um, the other thing, a couple other things, um, th we need to um, have a July date for our annual workshop and retreat. So the workshop will be a little bit of um, some training and some work with the lawyers similar to what we did. Um, it usually, I think, occurs at the end of July, like those last two weeks. So I will send out some dates just to see what works for the board so we can schedule something um, for that. And I think I, I last summer, I think it was just two hours, but maybe a little longer this time we'll need. So we will send that out. Um, Sue, Denise Van Campen and I visited North Berwick earlier this week for the select board to talk through our district budget and um, had some good questions, had some good conversation around um, how this year has gone with the hybrid plan and what types of technology and different things that we um, had to implement and purchase and use. And um, we're meeting with Berwick on Tuesday of next week, Thursday night is Lebanon. So we will have all three towns, um, all visits done by next week. And you are welcome to, and actually would love to have you there too for those for those meetings. If, if you want to show up in uh, your towns, the Berwick folks and the Lebanon folks. Right. Were those um, in person? No, I was just going to say the Berwick is remote. Yeah. That's and they remote. have not sent the link out yet. And Lebanon is in person. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, 
And we haven't had a lot of questions come in from Berwick or Lebanon yet. Um, I'm thinking when we go in, that's when we'll have those questions. So, and... Can you board us that way? Yes, when we get it, we'll board it. Okay. And then the other, so under other, but we can put it under superintendent, whatever you wish is the school start time and the seating chart. So if you want that, we can just continue moving ahead in this area or we can go bring that to other. Uh, it doesn't matter to me and I have a couple of questions around that, but we'll look at that page sure. and okay. see if it's answered. So the sure. seating chart, um, we talked about the seating chart at the April 8th meeting. Um, the standard operating procedures have changed five times. Like they, they've updated it five time, times. And when we met on, on April 8th, we talked about the seating chart and how we've been implementing seating charts in the cafeteria, in the on the buses, and that the middle and the high school would start implementing the seating chart. So the last two times that we've had to do some quarantining at the high school because of close contacts, we've utilized the seating charts. And that has cut down significantly on the amount of students that have had to quarantine. Because in the beginning of the year, it was necessary for us to kind of look at the whole class and take out maybe a whole class, or in some instances, very early on, because of the amount of time in rooms, like at the high school, the middle school, like the Maroons, the students had to go out for quarantine. So um, we are utilizing the seating charts and we'll continue to do so. So this is every class when, when the kids, if there was a seating chart yes. for each class of child attends. Yes. What we talked about on the 8th is that the elementary, the elementary is going to look different than the high school because our elementary teachers have reading groups, the students are going you know, come up to the table, so three students have been here for 15 minutes, or the teachers walking around, the, the children are, you know, in another group over here. So it, we may have to, and we did, with the Huzzy ones that we just had, um, even though there are seating charts, um, they needed to form the, the class. Um, so is it worth it to still have the seating charts at all? I think it's helped us here tremendously. But at the younger age? Well, we I, we need to do it anyway. Just it's, it's good practice. It's because it helps us track attendance and, you know, is a student out for an activity? Um, you know, is a speech therapist working with somebody? Um, so we're doing it that way for those purposes as well. And we have the seating charts in the cafeteria so we can look and see. <laughs> Yeah, the the back who are on the sides. Um, on the bus, we did have a bus um, get impacted by this latest one at Huzzy, and um, it, the amount of students that needed to be uh, quarantined on off the bus was minimal because of the seating chart and because of the window. So it is helping us. Um, so they're also, you know, when Amy, Sue and I talk at our, our almost daily meetings, there will be times that even though we're using a seating chart at the high school, depending on what's happening and who tested positive, it could take out the whole class again. I mean, it, depending on the proximity of the person, who the person is, you know, is it a staff member, is it a student? So there are many factors, even though the chart is in place. Have they changed any of the masking requirements for the students in school in the water and uh, outside time? They have not. No, nope. not yet. Yes. And what, what we did here um, the other day when we were talking about the um, vaccinations for the students, the CDC reps that were there were pretty insistent that they think the mask mandate will continue at least through the fall that we're not going to be expecting to see a lot of shift for that. Um, but that was this moment, you know, it's, that was their best guess at this moment based on the information they have. So it doesn't sound like that's gonna be a quick, come September, we're going to have no masks. And then when Sue and I have, have been in other meetings, we've heard that that will be one of the last things to change. Sure, today with Adams. 
little bit concerned that they were really hoping yeah. that their small children didn't have to go to school and wear masks in the fall. Right. So, fingers crossed. In, in general, this whole process is pretty frustrating when you have a playbook for the school district and a playbook for a registry department, a playbook for regular lay people, and every single one of them is different. The you got it. Group is right. different, and that's right. really annoying. It's so hard. It's different yeah. than yeah. I mean, it's the same from a business it's, standpoint. Yeah, where you've got it's one, You know, one set of rules for small businesses and yeah. another for large ones, and they're opposite. Right? Because <laughs> yeah. in reality, it's, in the, in the, you have law enforcement for the county with law enforcement, so there are exception rules for them, yeah. even though that we have measures in building. Yeah. And I mean, in reality, if you're wearing a mask, you're not you're considered for the CDC. You're not considered a close contact, right? Or you're not considered an exposed people to be wearing your mask the whole time. It's when you don't have your mask on for 15 minutes, then that's when you're considered exposure or more, right? But uh, on that particular, in school, like, we're wearing our masks. These kids shouldn't be considered close contacts, but the playbook is saying that they are. <laughs> and that's, you know, even goes back to, as you know, athletics. We had such a hard time with us athletics because the community sports guidelines were much different at yeah. that time in the fall than, yeah. than the school-based sports, and that caused a lot of friction for families. Yeah. So the whole thing has been attention. Just have, attention. Yeah, I've been involved in community baseball all through this whole process. We've had minimal, if any, issues in but our, our requirements are completely different. And frustrating that the CDC can't get on the same page for all the playbooks. So we've got different playbooks for each one. And I think it really boils down to the fingers that are involved in it outside of the CDC, all the other agencies involved. Our students continue to do a good job with, with masking. Um, it is hard, you know, the warmer weather's coming. It is, when the buildings are 90 degrees, it will be hot. And, but they did it in the fall, and we were able to use outside spaces more. And but as of right now, we can't go outside and not have our mask on, even though the governor says we we, we can don't take mask breaks. breaks. We're still taking mask breaks. No, that's right. So, the, yeah. so the, he's saying the new guidelines are that if you're outside and you have residence, you don't have to wear a mask. Period. Except for right. if you're a student. So we. <laughs> that's well, fine. We, that's not bad. Yeah. We have. So we had a conversation with the elementary administration about yes, because you could, if you can stay six feet apart the whole time, you can be without a mask at recess. Everybody was like, they can't. They're playing games, they're playing, you know, they're running around, playing chat, and you break that six feet ball. So, um, so that's the conversation that so we have. So you can choose, you either got to wear right. a mask and have interaction, right. or... Right. But yeah. what's the difference if that physical activity outside playing kickball or ag... After school. Versus, I mean, versus after school, if they're right. outside physical activity, they don't have to have right. a mask on. So what, right. what's but the yeah, difference so that, I mean, how, how, much that, that, <laughs> but how much of that is our interpretation, or our sort of district policy versus... I mean, that, I think that's a great question. If if people on a soccer field are allowed to play a contact sport without a mask on, mm -hmm. but kids at recess who are probably not going to have as much contact or not, is that really what like the guidelines still say that they have to have their mask on? They say that if you can't be the six feet, but at a playing field, it's okay to be squished yeah. up against someone. Right. Yeah, it's a different. It's a diff we have to follow the standard operating procedures that other activities don't have to follow. Right. Like and even it's, so the other piece is the MPA just opened up this whole piece about the non-masking, um, but we still are following under the DOE's piece of it. So, in terms of um, in terms of the masking piece and being and ha and being able to ensure that kids are six feet apart. And I you know and honestly. It's hard. There's no question that this is really difficult stuff, but we want our kids to be able to play and run around and hang out together in, at recess time. So in, in our world, it's just, I think, 
um, more appropriate to allow them to do that, but then they need to maintain their mask. So it's, it's, this is hard stuff. How does their mask break time look like? It's usually outside and they are six feet apart and they can t take off their masks and it's for like 10 minutes or so. So they're not uh, playing during that time? No, sometimes the teacher's reading with them. Sometimes if it's out here, they're eating a snack. Um, so different, those kinds of more sedentary activities. Yeah. They're in the shade structures outside that we had built. Um, so those are what the mask breaks look like. So are we not following MPA's guidelines with our boards right now? No, we are following it. We are following the guidelines for the MPA. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, but you just said we're following DOE. We are for our school day, during our school day, we follow what the DOE tells us, you know, what the standard right. operating procedure is for that. Sports is different but sport, though. Yeah, sports, sports is different. Yes. They're not required to wear a mask at all. Correct. Period. Correct. Right Except now. for if they're sitting on the bench together, they're supposed to be masked. You know, if they're not able to maintain that six feet during on the sidelines, it, to be, you know, not to be, it's crazy. <laughs> None of it makes any sense. But we're following, we're following the rules to the best that we can. Maybe we could get recess recategorized as a sport. Yeah. We'll get yeah. a recess. It's just that, like I said before, the boils down to it's very frustrating that you can't get guidelines to be the same across the board. And I well, think it took a long time for the community sports guidelines and the MPA guidelines to match up. You know? And then daycare is different than school. Mm -hmm. And then if you have Y care at school, what do they follow? Like all of it is so intricate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the, the start to the elementary school day. I'll just start with a little background on that and then we can talk. I think there are some questions about that. So we um, share the goal with the board of um, building in increased time for students. And we spent time looking at that at the high school, which was, which was challenging. And um, there were times at the elementary level when we looked at, is this a good time to do it to increase time? Is it not a good time? Um, I think if you remember throughout much of the winter, we were seeing an increase in cases at, like at the Knowlton School. We were getting a lot of emails, sending out a lot of information about um, Knowlton School. And then some of the other elementary schools kind of popped a little bit. So that was not a good time. Um, additionally, we were hearing from um, teachers that it was hard to fit everything in in a short time frame. So we had that information and we had information when we spoke with administration mm -hmm. that if we were to increase, um, have the buses come and pick up earlier, like a half hour earlier, that that, that would give us a little more time so that as we come into the busiest time of year as far as assessments, does it, does it give and afford the teachers the ability to do some of that assessing while still being able to run their program, their academic program? So I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna give you just an update on some of that testing, what it looks like. And last year we did not have to do this level of testing because we were remote. So some of the, we did not have to do the state testing. So right now in fifth grade, they have to do the main educational assessment in science. That's four hours. They also have to take the NWA, which is a standard, which is a, a computer-based test. They have to do that for literacy and math. That's two hours. And then they also um, take the benchmark assessment test. And that is done individually. With a, with a teacher and a student. And that can take 20 to 25 minutes per student. So we started hearing increased, um, honestly, some increased concern about, oh my gosh, this is a lot of testing. And it always is. This time of year, there's always a lot of testing. Like that hasn't changed. But what has changed is the time. You know, it's, we have a shorter period of time. So when we talked with the building administrators, 
we just talked with them first and talk through some of what, what does it mean if we were to increase, you know, have the buses here a half hour or so a little earlier. What does that mean? We went through it. It doesn't mean lunches had to shift. It doesn't mean special schedule had to shift. It just would mean that students would come in and either a teacher could start an assessment or they could do one of their activity or their lessons and then move to the assessments at a later time when they needed to do that. So it would just not crunch the day as much as it felt crunched. So we talked with this administration, we talked with our teachers association, and then um, we sent an email to, to the board and didn't talk to teachers at that point because we wanted, you know, that how do you share information and when do you share information and who gets the information. So we wanted to make sure that we shared it with the board, that we shared it with the teachers association chair, vice chair. And then we had the, the, the building principals after a few days talk with the staff. At that point, there was a letter ready to go. That, that was Monday, there was a letter to go to families. We received an email from the board just saying, could we hold and talk about this on Thursday? So at that point, we did not send that letter out to parents, but news travels fast and we have a lot of social media happening. And so word got out and we did not send out the letter that we were going to send out. So we did send something out on Tuesday based on the fact that it had gotten out um, and there was some erroneous information in there as well. And we knew that we wanted to talk tonight. It was a request to talk this evening. So the email, so the communication that went out to families said that we are, you know, we're looking at this as one piece. And if we make this decision, it's not going to happen. You know, we wouldn't make it on a Tuesday and change it on a Wednesday. That we would give at least a week's notice for that to happen. So that's kind of where we stand with it right now. We haven't done anything other than that one piece of community uh, feedback for families. Um, we talked to transportation who also said that that shift would not cause any backup anywhere, dropping off here or going to the Vogue program in Sanford. Um, so it, it seemed to accomplish the, the, the challenge that we were hearing about teachers feeling really crunched for time and really rushed to the curriculum in. Um, so I think that kind of led up to, I just wanted to give you the lead up to that. And I think there's been some question about, you know, do we have a whole talk and why didn't we vote? And I think some of that goes back to, if you think back to the high school, the request came from the board to see proposal changes. And because so many domino effect pieces for changing they needed to be presented in this case it was a shift of a half hour so it wasn't even shifting the hybrid plan a physical the physical plan it was shifting just a half hour in that plan so that is that's what led us here and we did have a lot, you know, we did get that feedback. So I know that we want to talk about that. So certainly, you know, certainly our intent was not to cause any kind of stress. We were stressed. We were hoping on, on the reverse of that, that it would alleviate some stress and it would um, get us somewhat back to, you know, closer to a, a regular kind of schedule that we had had before. And it was still modified, even though it would be starting about a half hour earlier, it's still a modification to their day. It's still, they would be getting out, not at the same time that they were getting out last year. Um, so, so that's just the backstory of that. I have a, just a couple of questions. Um, and thank you for the, for the backstory. Yeah. I think obviously timing and communication yes. is, is probably the biggest mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Um, how did you look at adding three Wednesdays 
to cover the testing time or something like that. Um, is, is looking at adding some Wednesday time, something that you guys consider? We didn't can fully consider the time. Part of it is because some of the testing is so particular about when you take it. Okay. It has to be done in a certain Order. time frame. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just a quick question. Have the elementary students had any other schedule changes? No. Okay. So no. Except that they had to go over for quarantine. Okay, so there's a lot of feedback around all of the schedule changes, but it's not, I didn't think the elementary had had that. So, I mean, my two cents um, is that I feel like, I mean, I feel like, I also feel like most of the board has been trying pretty hard to get kids access to more in-person learning. and. I, one of my frustrations is that I feel like with each parent we're sort of faced with, um, you know, input from uh, that all come down to scheduling. And I feel like this is, I'm sure, going to be a challenge for some parents and families, but it's one that actually works for the school. And I, nobody, nobody wants to spend time doing standardized testing. It's required, and it's part of our it's part of our education system, and I believe that also impacts funding to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that it's this isn't something it's something that's going to have to happen one way or the other. And so personally, I feel like this is just one small way that we can get some kids some extra time, you know, so that they're not going to sacrifice their regular classroom time. Um, and I, I just, I would hate to pass up an opportunity to actually accomplish what we have been trying to accomplish, um, just because it's not ideal from a scheduling standpoint. But that's just me. I have a question about the testing. Um, MEAs and MEAs are required. Are the bench is that benchmark test required by the state? We, it's part of our thing. It's part of our Title I yep. um, grants that we get. We need to uh, use a, use a, uh, a norm reference test to show growth for students in the fit. And it, it, so it's tied into Title I. Right. right. So that it's that you know, every year you guys approve the Title I and Title II and all those applications and our um, basically our documentation of how our process is going is based on those assessments and whether or not we're meeting our benchmarks. So that's, that is unfortunately one of the results of receiving federal grants. I just, I mean, I know we have to do them, but is, does anybody believe here that we're going to see tremendous growth this year? I mean, really? No, but I think it actually the fact that we are, I, I think in yeah. context will actually be really important. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, I think it'll be. I mean, no, no, nobody thinks that. I, I, but I, I don't. I think that you don't just measure when the when it's a good scenario. I just, I, I think for the parents who, I mean, they've dealt with the, the, the schedule changes and all this stuff. I think to do this the last month of school is a big mistake. You lose the kids at the end of the year anyway, as far as attention span, for the last couple of weeks. And it's like, I, I can't even believe having to have all these parents change the child care plans or how what time they get to work or whatever plan they've had to do um, just because of testing. Can I jump in a second? Yes, yes Stephanie. Thanks. Um, just because this might kind of help figure things out. Uh, you'd have to talk to the DOE about it, but my suggestion would be let's do the testing and just do operational testing and let's skip the field testing because I don't think the field testing is gonna provide what they're looking for it to for the grade level right now and where the kids are at. So cut off field testing until next year and just do operational and that's gonna cut down the time a lot. It is um, a conversation that we would need to have with the DOE, you're absolutely correct. And they, I was just gonna say, and if anybody's lost about what it is that I just said, let me know if you don't know the difference between operational and field test, I'm throwing it out, assuming that you might know, but if you don't, I can give a quick explanation on that. Go ahead. It's good for people to, to hear that. Okay. 
So operational is uh, the, the questions that get used. They've already been, okay, so let me start with field test. That makes more sense. Uh, field test is a brand new question, just getting put out there and it's tested with a certain grade. It goes and um, the DOE sits down with um, the test writers and they look at the responses and they say, did this question do what we wanted it to? Do we like the kind of responses we're getting? Are we, are we seeing what we want to see from the question? If they like it, it can put through to operational. And then the operational scoring um, is actually what the scores are that the students are getting. Right. The test, um, they don't get scored on. It's just literally looked at as, is this a good question or not? So um, what I was getting at is if we do the field testing next year to see if the question looks good and all that stuff, I don't think it's a big deal to put that off for a year. Um, the operational is the one that they need the scores for. And it, each area has a different amount of operational versus field test. So it does make a difference for science versus math versus reading and all that. But it really could cut down on some time if you, if you just did what you actually had to do. It's an interesting concept. We'll, uh, we'll dig into it a little bit. Um, okay. And, but just so one, well, I just wanted to, I did get a, um, a text message from a principal just now that said, just to, in your, uh, in their all defense, our kids defense, we believe we're gonna see some growth. Like we don't think that our kids have not done anything this year. We do feel like kids are learning. Um, so that was, they just wanted to make sure the board knew that they definitely feel strongly that our kids are going to show growth. I agree. Well, I just don't think it's going to be the same amount of growth we usually see. Um, understood. Understood. Um, Jamie, hold on. I have to go to the chat. She said something in the chat here. Let's see. Um, and what Jamie stated, Jamie Palmeyer Stewart, according to what I've been reading from the DOE, skipping this testing is unlikely to be approved, which is true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our curriculum, the curriculum group for uh, this area um, in Southern Maine have worked hard to try to get it to be forgiven like it was last year. But we were, well, even up until the, the 12th hour, we were almost going to have to do this last year. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you just said, that you don't think requests to skip it will be approved. You right. don't think... Right. Ja Jamie right. is just speaking from what she's been reading at the state level. And she feels that what she's reading is that they're not going to approve allowing us to skip the test. And that's exactly what we know to be true. And they, in fact, they put in the testing that they're doing. It's called the NWEA, which is... Um, now I don't even know if that's the Northwest Educational Assessment um, is a very, um, it's not even exactly the same kind of testing that the regular MEA has been over the years. It's more of a, it is a growth test. Um, so we'll, yeah, they're, 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 pre they're pretty um, strongly supportive of this at, at the state level. And it's because it's also a federal requirement that we test our students on an annual basis. So they're, they're responding to the heat from the federal government as well. And they actually, the, the historical testing that we've done for literacy would take five sessions or three to five sessions and then math, three to five sessions, like our sessions or longer. And then the science for certain grade levels would also be an additional four hours. So it is cut back, but it's still... Yep. It's still testing. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add to that the NWEA testing data is instantaneous and it's usable data. It's really more formative than it is any right. kind of summative assessment. And so it is going to take us a little bit of time to prep the kids and get them used to it. But the data that we're going to get back from it is going to be significantly better than some previous MPA testing that takes multiple days and multiple hours. And then several months to get any and results. Exactly from. right. Yeah, this is actually a good step, but it is time, time, time from the classroom. Yeah. Oh. Um, and we're going to share, just so you know, we will certainly share all the, the data that we have because we've all been, you know, we've all been monitoring and looking at the data. But when all is said and done, we do want to see what that growth has been this year. Yeah. So I think we're going to be surprised and happy. Well, they've been, everybody's been working. Yeah, super hard. 
Yeah. So um, what about the kids that are remote? Are they doing the same testing? Yes, they're doing the NWEA testing. And I don't know how they're doing the science testing. I know they've had a couple of training sessions on the NWEA. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that an email went out on Tuesday. How did that go out? Tuesday morning. How did that go out? It went out um, via the central office. You know how we send a messenger out? Yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it went to all towns. I never received anything. Okay. And it appears that only one certain town received that letter that got posted on Facebook. Um, Would it have gone to all parents? It was elementary parents. It went to North Borough and Borough and Lebanon. But just elementary? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Kate, yes. Kate, yeah. but. But okay, yeah. I didn't get it, but I did not know that. Right. Um, but Nancy, you got it? I think so, but again, okay. I, I, guess. I, got, I got the COVID one okay. that day. Okay. Uh, but we did, and I don't believe many other people did get that one. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, I think overall, my biggest frustration with this whole process is that I don't think it was handled appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should have had some involvement in the process from the get go. But we could have had some opportunities. We talked about schedule a lot. Yeah, yeah, where it could have been brought up, and it wasn't. Um, and I think I think a, a Wednesday idea would have been a decent idea to get the kids back in school on a Wednesday to, to try and do this stuff. Um, but I think at this point we're now five weeks left, less, less than five weeks left. I think it, it's going to be, is it really worth doing a big change like this for the last couple of weeks? Um, I think, like I said, my biggest frustration was the way that this whole process was handled um, correctly. And I think it caused some, uh, a lot of unnecessary uh, drama that didn't need to be had uh, between the fact that he got notified one day, staff got notified, and then we're telling kids, and then we're telling parents, and then we didn't send out a letter at all. Uh, or that I never got a letter. Um, I think it, it was, you know, that's my biggest frustration. I don't mean overall. I think if this discussion would have been had when we were having schedule changes or and having those and having more time in it, I think if, you know, the reason behind why we need to make that schedule change would have been put out there, I think you would have had more um, people willing to make the change. I think at this point now, we're 25 weeks old. Well, by the time you know, parents yeah, you know, four or three weeks, and I believe the test was, as you were talking about, start on Monday anyway. June is the bigger chunk of the is open up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How many weeks do, do the elementary school kids have left? They have six weeks. Six weeks. So, I mean, it's 12 extra hours, you know. Again, I'm not one of the I'm not a parent that has to change their schedule here, but I feel like if this is something, if the teachers are coming to you guys saying we need more time with the kids to get this work done, and we do have a way that works with the rest of the district, that will impact some families from a schedule standpoint, but it's not it's not a massive overhaul. I feel like, other than sort of the way the communication piece of all of it, which I, I do think there was ample opportunity to, to bring it up earlier, but um, I, I feel like I, I, I can't keep thinking of sort of the sort of, there's only a month left, is it really worth it? Because I just feel like at this point, every minute is worth it that we can get. And, and, and each one of those is going to be a pain to try to schedule, but that's, I feel like, everything we've done this year. Well, I guess I have a question. You said teachers have been talking to you. Was there a formal survey done of all the elementary No, teachers? and we did not do a survey, and we do have some teachers that are very excited at the prospect of having students in, and we have some teachers who are a little more reticent, just like we've had all the way through when we've had conversations about increasing time. Um, we have a pocket of, of staff that are 
um, you know, concern for various reasons. And we have a, a, another pocket of staff that are very much like, we'll see them as, as much as we can. But that, through conversations, through informal conversations, those are the pieces of information that we've been getting about more time. But if those teachers are already, like I think Nancy, you said that that's sort of professional development, like they're already in, they're already working during that time yes. just doing others. So there's no change to their schedule, except that mm -hmm. the students are in the classroom versus. No, but I thought that was supposed to be part of their prep time. They have, they have shorter specials this year. They have, so if we, if we do this, Right now, the schedule is at the elementary school that staff are coming in at 8.30. That would bump them to come in at 8.20 instead of 8.30. And then student arrival would happen around 8.30, 9 o'clock. And then they would release at quarter of three. So they would still have their 25-minute duty-free lunch. They would still have their 30-minute planning period, but they would also not have student dismissal go until 3.40. So they would still be done. So they would still have a shortened abbreviated day to, to hit work on that side. And then Wednesday would remain the same. So that what we ex what the expectation has been on Wednesday is for students to do some some um, reinforcement activities, maybe a, a class meeting, and then teachers have their professional meetings or some planning. And that's a huge chunk because if you remember in the beginning, the proposal was to have students in a half day on Wednesday. And then the board felt at that point like we needed to, to have a, a larger chunk of time for teachers on for Wednesday. Um, so that was the remote day for students. So they will have that chunk of time on Wednesday for planning. They will have that 30 minutes. They will have the duty-free 25-minute lunch. And then the students would still get out of school at the current time, which is earlier than it has been in the previous but years. But they'll, they'll lose that extra planning time at the beginning of the day. They will, yes. But they won't lose a planning period, meaning they'll still no, have the planning time period. because, because you should right. for special. So mm -hmm. you got to look at the total number of minutes. Right. Yes. Yeah. What was the, the well, I guess you just answered the question that you got some that are supportive and some that are against it, because I've heard both sides of yeah. the and, and so I was curious if we had, if you just answered that question, so I don't that. I think one of the bigger stressors is um, those classrooms, and we don't have a lot of classrooms, it's, and it's not every one, but some of the classrooms where there's a split. You know where we have a teacher and an ed tech kind of working together with the with the classes um somewhat ne negotiating some of that is a little harder so some of the teachers that are doing that it's just um a another layer of thinking about how to do that um with the with the increase you know if we came in earlier anybody else have any questions about that I think, I think that this entire time, we have done everything that we can, in disregarding the communication issue, to get as many minutes of students in front of teachers as possible, whether it's for testing or anything else. And I understand it's five weeks, but it's five weeks, it's 12 hours. Um, um, you're right, you're not going to make everybody happy, but the ultimate goal is to get these kids um, as much time as possible. and if we don't, and all of their school time for the last four or five weeks is all testing. I, 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 right, the communication piece is a mess, but I, I definitely say if there's an opportunity to get students in front of a teacher for an additional 15 minutes, 30 minutes up, then I would, uh, that's how I would go. I guess I'd want to know what the answer is for what the DOE would have to say about just doing operational because that that could make it so the schedule wouldn't have to change and the amount of time for testing wouldn't be as much so they would be getting more uh, teaching time. I feel like for me that that would make it an easier you know decision. I just feel we but unfortunately created a lot of ill will towards families with this and I don't I I'm not in favor of it. I just don't think I, at this point in the year we should do that to kids. I mean 
they've had their whole educational years been turned upside down, and I just don't think we should do it again. All right, I, mean, I, think, I think if we had this discussion for the April aspect like we did with the high school, then I think we could have. I think we it would have been a little more easier to absorb and be done. I think now it's because it's so last minute and we're expecting them to change. I mean, I would assume it wouldn't be until Monday of next week by now, but um, you know, so they'd be, they have a little bit more notice to make some changes, but I just think, I think we kind of missed the boat on this one. You're talking, just so for clarification purposes, you're talking about 30 extra minutes in the morning, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, tonight we heard from uh, not a lot, but we had a lot of parents that made comments, and and the problem with that is they've made their adjustments already, just like we have with every other schedule change that we've had throughout high school. Right. And so we already had a lot of feedback, correct. like two months ago, saying we everything we can possibly yeah. do to get every kid as much time as possible. Correct. And I get it. It's it's only four or five, maybe six weeks, but again, it's an opportunity to get to get that. And and I am sort of saying, but we're not changing lunches, we're not changing anything, we're just having them come in mm -hmm. 30 minutes earlier. So the sacrifice, is. the thing is that the testing has to happen no right. matter what. Right. So well, the sacrifice, sacrifice is actually the learning time right. if we don't add if we don't yeah. add 30 minutes. And I mean, really, if you've been testing two or three hours a day, it's a really a lot to expect kids to continue to learn the rest of the day when they've been test mode and their brains are not. Right. You're saying 30 minutes early, I got that part, but it's also that it would, the release time would be earlier, right? So it's not just a front end adjustment, it's, it's morning and afternoon? No, it's just the morning, just 30 okay. minutes. No adjustment to the afternoon step at all. I misunderstood, thanks. I gotta think about that now a little bit more. Joy, are you? Look, you're reporting. Okay. I'm just having a really bad time hearing tonight. Yeah, I so, said. So, <laughs> what is it? Every morning, there's going to be additional time, or just one day? I mean, it, it would be Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And then the, an additional how much time? The 30 minutes in the morning, 30 to a little longer, like because Lebanon has a further okay. way to go, you know, for pick up and drop off. Okay. So about approximately 30. Okay. Just in the morning. So the dismissal would be the same. Okay, so an yeah. extra two hours a week. Yes. Could it be optional? Back to a regular school day length, right? Correct. Right. It's a, it's been a, the whole school day has been shorter all year. Well, it wouldn't be a, a full school day length. It would be a, the original start time. Close to but the original start time. So even with this, it still wouldn't be the, the same as, it wouldn't right. be as much as a regular school Correct. day. Correct. It's still short. I, I, you know, I, I, this, there's no easy, this is really a because I can truly end up on either side of this. And I think I'm, I think I would err on the side of getting the kids back here for the extra half hour. I know the timing is really bad, and the communication was not perfect. These have been working through. And, the goal has been, and we've stated it as a group, that we wanted the kids to have more time in school. And I know it's going to be difficult for some families, but I think there's going to be other families that are going to be really excited about having the kids at school that extra time. So I'm going to go on to the side of the school. So Steph's asking whether or not this could be optional for people. Um, I, I think that that would be too much of a, yeah. a stressor in the classroom. Like if you think about when you have students absent or coming in tardy, how much that impacts the flow and the, the output of lessons, that's really hard. That's yeah. true. Okay. I, I'm still trying to figure out, probably like everybody else, a good answer for everybody. And <laughs> right. it's like, same way as Joanne, where it's like, I could go, I, I can see both sides and it's a really tough decision. Lynn, or I don't even know if this is yes, still on, but Lynn, um, do you have any comments, questions, anything? Okay. 
So where do we go from here? And like originally this wasn't even something we were gonna vote on, is what would you write? So do you want a strong poll? Do you want a vote? Do you want nothing? Well, I can I'll say, I'll back it up and say the reason why that the, the high school again, the reason why the high school came in, did a presentation, is because there was a proposal that we looked at and um, so this was just this was just adding that half hour to the day. So it wasn't such nuanced shifts that needed to occur. Um, at this point, you are representing the towns, and I think if we could have a straw pool, I think that may be the way to go. All right, let's do a straw pool. Um, I guess doesn't really matter what we start with. <laughs> um, who is in favor of moving the start time for 30 minutes? I don't know, Stephanie and Lynn, no? I, I was still thinking, yeah, I guess I am tipping more towards that. And I would still like the follow up with the DOE just to see if that might make any difference. But yeah, I'll go. I mean, honestly, that if there was a way, even if we didn't do it, and there was a way to do less testing, that's that's always a good thing anyway, right? So, um, so then, and then I guess I'm opposed to it. Lynn, are you in favor or opposed? She never lies. I'm not sure. I'm kind of in the middle. Yeah. Okay. So, and I kind of missed the opposed that. So I know you two. And then, Stephanie, where did you end up? I ended up in favor. So, I don't know. I guess in conclusion, it's a really hard decision. <laughs> but I think, um, I think that. I would say the takeaways from this, and unfortunately, we can't go back and fix the communication. Um, but maybe some acknowledgement that uh, yes, you know, more communication would have been helpful, and that we understand that this is definitely an impact to families. Um, you know, you can't go backwards, right? Um, maybe, maybe it makes sense for us to go back to our administrative team, go back to our teaching, like, you know, to, to Brenna and Jamie and talk this through a little bit and, and talk to you guys. I don't know how to, I, I'm just thinking about how to, we can't make it perfect, right? We can't appease everybody, but I want to make sure that we're all moving forward in the right direction, I guess. Well, and you're kind of stuck in a place right now where you want to give parents enough time to adjust, but you don't want so much time to go by where it's not worth making the change. Right. Yes. Okay. We're going yep. Through the rest yeah. of the change. That's another problem. Yeah. Okay. I think we just have some things to think about, Audra. That's right. Work it through. Well, I think I, I mean I look at my situation in general. It, it's going to be difficult on certain days for me to make the 8.30 to 9 o'clock drop-off. So does our bus and availability... Uh, that's a great question. Does our bus and availability allow for more students to be able to take the bus? I mean, I think you have. I think we have to. Right. I think if yes. somebody yes. has to go from being dropped off to taking the bus, we have to accommodate that. Right. That's a, yeah, that's a good point. That's a great point. And I think that already come up though. I think about the buses. Well, the buses can make yeah, sure. the time. The time. Yeah. Yeah, but what about the, the amount of kids on the bus? Are, are those available? Because I at one point had a lot of buses. I gave it up because I didn't need it and I wanted more people to. But um, I guess I want more kids to be able to have them. I still have my kids still have to well. Yeah, I would say we could, I mean, there, you couldn't you couldn't make people do a wait list. Okay. I feel like most people with it going earlier, like, aren't going to fall in that direction. But is there room on the buses, Andre? There, with based on some the recommendations on the bus, we can put more students on the bus. Yes, so if we needed to. <laughs> 
That is something we can talk about for sure. If we can, just forget about the two weeks, if we can put our kids back into school on Wednesdays for half a day, it might be better off than. I, I, I think that's going to have a bigger impact. I think that's going to have a bigger impact. A impact. much bigger impact. I know, very, it's it's very well good. Yep. Well, I, I know I do. I know some families that have trouble on Wednesdays because they have no place to put their kids because of the school. Mm -hmm. right? uh, mm -hmm. They're every week. Look at so. I mean, okay, so I guess, is it fair to say as a board that if this is the plan you go with as a board, we will support it, knowing that it, you know, it has its challenges and it's not perfect, et cetera. But if you guys, is, is it safe to say as a board that if they were able to put this into a couple of Wednesdays, they don't need to bring it back to us for support? Would we all, does anybody have an issue with that? I don't have an issue. But aren't you, when you talk about the buses, they're coming in earlier. Now you're adding an addition. You're not just. Right, you're adding an yeah, additional lunch. Yeah, you're yeah, adding an thing. additional lunch as well? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, that's that's the the day. more. Right. So, no, Wednesdays. Wednesdays are tougher. Okay. We were look this half hour start time, so we'll, we'll definitely start some families schedules. Right. Was the least, right. was, was the least impact to families okay. when you looked at it as a whole. So if you find out a situation will accommodate students that need to come, I think that that kind of that's a big yes. It changed my yeah. opinion. I think if the kids couldn't get us, right. we could get them on the buses. But the kids that needed the transportation, I didn't even think of that aspect of it until Travis brought it up. Okay. I don't think that um, I don't think that you should wait until another board meeting. No. I think I feel like you guys have what you've heard what you yes. need to from us. Yes. Okay. Yep. And we heard the piece about um, how to communicate that out and talking about the communication piece and acknowledging that communication challenge. Yep. Can I look back to the incident or the discussion that we had earlier, um, kind of follow that other email that I sent out or that I forwarded mm -hmm. with the seating charts and all sure. that stuff? Um, the, the feedback that I'm hearing tonight is that we're not, we have, I guess, how do the students know whether or not they're in seat in charge or not? Are they aware of it or is it just being handled by teachers behind the scenes? The teachers are filling out a seat in charge. Yeah. So some, I can't say every teacher is doing it the same yeah. Some teachers are having them sit in and then they're filling out the chart. Others have the chart ahead of time and students are sitting in the, based on the chart. But, like, even in here, we're sitting in almost the same spots we were before. Right. So students may come in and sit in that spot, and the teachers are, are writing down where they're sitting. Yes. So overall, we're following yes. the seat and chart aspect. Yes. And if there's a child that needs to be quarantined, it's probably because they were within the seat and chart area. Unless there's a certain situation where it's a staff member was moving All through the classroom right. a certain way, or if it was if it was moving around a certain way in the classroom. Okay. Uh, 
somebody in another meeting. Alright. Can we move on to the next one? One last question. At what point are we going to start? Is talking seriously about next year? I'm just going to ask yeah. that question. <laughs> sure. Preliminarily, we can tell you that um, we are working to get everybody back in there full time. Great. Um, okay. And we've been doing that for a couple months now. Yep. Looking at that, and um, even with even with the masking and the furniture, certainly furniture we need to get. We things some things aren't going to be ideal, like where the children are eating lunch and different things like that, but we will certainly give you the present, you know, certainly talk through what that looks like. Um, in addition to that, though it hasn't come out at the state level, it just makes it's common sense for us to realize that we're going to have to come up with what happens if we have a surge and we have to go back to socially distancing significantly, what does that mean? So we will have a plan for that as well. So we will share those with you. So all students have to come back in their regular buildings? That is what we've been working toward. And have yes. we heard anything from DOE on their playbook changes? <laughs> no. I mean, I would no. like to think that the three to six foot rule will be gone by the all. We have an honor of three. It's depends on who we play with. It's the right. Yeah. It's the right. Great, yeah. Okay, so, but yes, that's our goal. That's what we're going to do. Um, to get to, and we will go through that. Yep. Anything else? Are there others? Is graduation is still going to be outside. That's the plan. It is still outside. Do you have the update on that? It's the 12th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm the one that's on the door. That's, that's right. right. That's right. It's the 12th, I believe, is that. Two o'clock, you know, and um, I think there more tickets for families. Yes, yes. not a touch room. More tickets for the family. It's, I can't move. So how how seating is going to happen outside is it's going to be like um, two spots and then six feet, two spots, six feet. So if you have a family of four, they're going to be they can set some chairs and put them together, but you see, then you still need to go up and around. I don't know if we're going to build that. I don't think we're going to build that. And there will be a limited amount of extra tickets, um, and there will be a process used to go through that. And I think we are doing some seating, but some of the lawn seating is the students will be on the lawn, and there's some. And it will be a regular full walk, up, like spread out, but walk. Up. I believe there's going to be a Yes, I believe. Yes. Yes. Two months are also not paid, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. We're gonna, we'll, yeah. Yeah. we'll talk through. We'll go through particular Right. Exactly. I don't need a ticket. 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 I don't than what we are typically yeah. able to do. Mm -hmm. So there, you may get back on that, and we are, the high school is doing the best that they can with that. When you look at where everybody's seating, it's going to look like there's a lot more space, but you have to have that six foot buffer between. And it is six feet outside. Yes. Yes. Is that something that's, is that like, uh, up It's large gatherings. So this is yeah. not competition. So are we going to which play? <laughs> They're going to match. They're going to match. They're going to match. Okay. Hurdles. So there's going to be a process coming up that we need more tickets. There's going to be an ability to get more tickets, but still be within your early box. It may not be. They, they may not all be together. Okay, well, that's, I mean, I feel like if people are together, that's not the end right. of the world. Right. Get more people in. Yes. Right, yeah. 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 But just know that, that I know that this is always. 
a discussion point, and it'll be this way, I mean, this year as well, because of more tickets. I mean, I think, I, I'm sure we'll get pushback. I also would like to think that people will be more understanding, because up until recently, we didn't even know if there would be a right. graduation. Right, right, right. So the walk up on the stage. That's right, yeah. yeah. And it's going to be a live stream. Yes. And different locations. Yeah. Um, you know, or not, I should say, live stream in different locations that will be live stream. Watch it. Right. You can hear your leisure. Yeah. Okay. And do you want to watch? Uh, is there any other public input? Uh, hold on, let me check. She's in charge of the I, <laughs> I do not see any more public input. It's just like she dives into a hole to check. Yeah. Comes back up. That's, <laughs> it's kind of what I do. I'm like, oh, there we go. I'll second it. This is Nancy. Jane and Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. For next year. I know. Stephanie, you're on your own out there. Did we lose Lynn? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. <clears throat> Oops, I should text Chris. Shut us off. I am going to. <laughs>